All right, hi, I'm Ellie Pavlik. I'm very excited to be here today. I'm a professor of computer science at Brown University and also a research scientist at Google. Um, I work on large language models and uh, these other vision models as well. Um, and I primarily work on trying to understand kind of the, how they work under the hood. So some of these issues of opening up the black box, trying to um, see if we can get a more precise understanding and be able to control them better. Um, but I was asked to give a fairly high level talk today to get everyone on the same page about what is Gen AI. So I'm sorry if some of you are as technical as maybe Eric had assumed everyone is, but if there are some of you who are here because you're kind of just interested to learn, like what is this chat GPT, I'm gonna give a very high level um, uh, intro to basically what are we talking about, what do we mean by generative AI as opposed to maybe the AI that you might have heard about uh, even just one year ago. Um, and then, uh, again, a super high level understanding of just kind of how does it work, so what are the main components that, um, that go into producing a system with this kind of abilities, um, and I'd be happy to talk about more of the lower level technical stuff on how it works afterward if people are interested. Um, and I'll talk briefly about some of the opportunities, although I think that's actually more you guys' expertise. I'm not an entrepreneur. Um, so that's where like, the, I think your creativity comes in. I wanna spend more time highlighting kind of what are the major risks. So if you're thinking about trying to deploy these in some new kind of uh, setting, some new startup, um, or adding some uh, generative AI components to an existing company, I think it's really important to keep in mind these kinds of fundamental limitations, things we don't yet understand that maybe we will five or 10 years out, but we don't understand now. And so it entails some significant risk, I would say. Okay, so what do we mean when we're talking about generative AI? I would say kind of my definition is we're talking about AI models, but that can produce kind of open-ended and creative content. So typically when we thought of AI, we think about things like prediction. It's giving you like a yes or no, this uh, review is positive or negative, something like that, or a very uh, constrained set of possible outputs. With generative AI, we're thinking about things that are open-ended and uh, fundamentally what we would think of as creative. So we talked a lot about text. Um, I don't know if you can read this. Yes, yeah, so this is asking ChatGPT to like make an announcement for this summit. And it actually does, a, I think, quite a nice job. Right, so I'm sorry for whoever did the marketing for this summit, but I guess you could have you could have watched Netflix and let ChatGPT do that work for you. Um, we're also talking about image generation, so this is a really popular uh, use case. Where um, uh, so here I was, I actually tried to spend I spent a bit of time trying to make it make a logo for this summit, and it did quite a bad job. They were like really generic and things like that. So there's some jobs that are safe, but something like this, a <laughs> robot painting at an easel. Um, it's able to produce pretty nice images of these kinds of things and it'll provide quite a bit of variety and you can kind of refine it iteratively. Um, there's also things like music generation. So it's like text and images are really like the, the big ones right now that people are talking a lot about, but there's also applications to things like music. Um, I was going to click um, and play some of these, but I think in time I won't, So, um, but I would encourage you to Google this. It does quite a nice job um, generating text or music from a description. Um, and other one that I didn't have an image of, but code generation is a really huge one, right? So like uh, we were just heard in the panel, you think of uh, code as a language and these models are really impressive. I think that's something that surprised a lot of people is how good they are at generating code. So things like software engineering, a lot of those applications could be um, potentially automated. Okay, so how does this work? Um, there's really kind of three components to think about with, um, I'll focus on language models, on generative language models, because um, the basic principles are similar for image and music and code, um, although with some details different. Um, so there's kind of like three, maybe like buzzwords to have in mind. The first is that they're neural network models, so we've been hearing about deep learning, we've been hearing about neural networks a lot, um, and, the, and neural networks are a very old technology, actually. Um, if you are familiar with neural networks, great. If not, um, this is kind of the picture you have in mind when <laughs> Delphine's talking about being able to write them down on paper. Um, you can still write down them on paper, you'll just need a lot of paper, right? But like the actual principles are still there. So if we're thinking about something like a neural network language model, what it's doing is learning associations between words, right? So it, all it's doing is learning, for example, when I see a word like generative, what types of words tend to come next, and it's gonna learn some kind of distribution over those. So generative is likely to be followed by AI right now, maybe also design and psychology. Apparently design, generative design and generative psychology are things I Googled it yesterday. Um, and it might learn a different set of associations for different types of words, right? Um, so when we take this kind of basic model, the, like, the key part, I think what's been doing really the heavy lifting in generative AI, in particular language models, is what we call the language modeling task which is just this task of predicting the next word in a sentence for a very, very large amount of text. 
So you know, literally what the model is asked to do is you're just like, hey model, it's had no training yet. You say, I'm about to write a sentence. What do you think the first word is? And it's just gonna take a guess, right? It's gonna be like the, and then you're like, nope, it was I, right? And it like makes some updates to its weights so that next time it's slightly more likely to say I instead of the, or it puts them at equal mass or something. And then you say, okay, you said I, what comes next? Maybe it does a good job here, I guess it's something like am, because that's likely to follow I. And you do this repeatedly, repeatedly, and every time it gets a new word, it's making some updates and it's remembering something about the distribution of words that it's seen um, in text, right? And so this means that when you basically take one of these language models, you can just start writing and then at some point tell it to take over and it'll do a pretty good job of just um, coming up with a plausible continuation of text. Um, and this seems very simple, and it is actually incredibly simple. Like there's a lot of uh, kind of you know hardware and software things that happen under the hood to make it happen, but the principle is incredibly simple. I think that's something that's surprised a lot of us in the field. Um, and uh, what really gives it power is this scale. So we talked about increasing complexity. That complexity isn't actually a change in the underlying model, it's just making it bigger. And by bigger, we mean a lot more of these neurons, so it's learning a lot more of associations between words and groups of words and groups of groups of words. Um, and it's uh, reading a lot more data, right? So there's different ways of making it more complicated, but this is kind of giving you a sense, so I would say, uh, generated, like I would put the ELMO model spring of 2018 as like the first one of the kind of modern group of generative AI models or these large language models. Um, and at the time this was, model was considered to be huge and it was so exciting. Like I remember reading the paper and everyone was like so excited and it's just taken off literally exponential growth in the size of these models and with it this, these kinds of impressive capabilities. Um, there's another component that comes up, and I don't want to go into a ton of details, but you'll probably hear about it or will hear about it more, um, in particular because it's been associated with chat GPT um, and other kinds of models. And this is a reinforcement learning component. So basically a model like this is just generating plausible sequences of text on the internet, which doesn't mean it's necessarily good at doing useful tasks. So if I were to ask it a question, for example, if I just go to a large language model trained this way and I say like, um, what is a you know, who are good speakers to invite to my summit? It might give me an answer like good speakers, but that's actually not the kind of document that exists on the internet. More likely it's gonna give you like a list of questions you should be asking yourself when you're planning a summit. So if I say, who are some good speakers I should invite? It should say, where should I host? How many people should I invite? What platform should I use? Like just a list of questions, right? Which isn't what you were going for. So like this generative component by itself isn't particularly useful at tasks in and of itself unless your task is to generate documents. So instead we do this reinforcement learning component where basically it generates lots of examples and people give up or down votes. So this is important for a couple reasons. Um, it's important for getting the model to basically do the task you actually want it to do. Um, it's important for being able to give it negative feedback, so tell it examples of things that are bad that you don't want it to do. So this has been a main mechanism used to, for example, prevent the model from saying um, harmful things, from giving instructions on how to you know, build a bomb or something that, uh, for example, companies like OpenAI don't want the model to produce, right? So that's really the reinforcement learning component. And if you're thinking about something like building um, one of these models from scratch or doing some customization for applications, likely the reinforcement learning component is a place where that would happen. Um, I think it's also important to highlight because it's also associated with a lot of the bad behavior. So once we start running reinforcement learning, there's often a lot more uncertainty in how the models will behave. It makes, can make them much more creative. It can also make them higher risk. So it's just a thing to keep in mind. All right, so my kind of um, three, a three uh, sentence summary or three part summary of what are something like generative language models would be their neural networks, they're first trained on this predicting the next word, and then they're kind of optimized for your task through reinforcement learning. All right, so like I said, um, we can talk kind of briefly about major opportunities, um, but I would actually say that's more you guys' expertise, so I'll just throw out some of the things I've heard that I think are exciting to think about. Um, I like this analogy, I forget where I heard it, so I don't know who to credit for this, um, but this idea of thinking of it as kind of like calculators, but for open-ended content, right? So in the way that you might have, um, like people previously spent a lot of time, you know, like human computers back in the 50s, you know, just doing actual calculations, and that uses a lot of like uh, uh, mental energy from very intelligent people on somewhat routine and formulaic tasks. Once you have calculators and computers to do those computations for them, their time is freed up to work on more challenging, more creative um, types of things. So now if you can imagine replacing some of the kind of more mundane parts of creative tasks, so 
um, then you can free up your, your people's time to work on things that can't be automated. Um, so the kinds of things that I hear a lot of uh, uh, people throwing out as kind of possible um, things that are ripe for, for this kind of automation are like components of customer service, um, a lot of software engineering and code generation, right? Like you wouldn't want all of your code written by a model, but there's a lot of really, for people who are software engineers, there's a lot of very routine stuff that time is wasted on. Um, anything that requires writing text, so reporting and drafting and um, writing outlines and making slides, like these kinds of things, um, design and illustration, and much more things. Um, but like I said, I want to focus primarily on the risk because I think this is something that's really important to be thinking about, and especially when we get all swept up in the optimism, right? Like we don't want to be doomsdayers about the, the huge risks of them, but we also want to be realistic about um, where we are in this kind of development of this technology and what kinds of changes we're likely to see um, in the coming years that could entail some just realistic risks and also some financial risks if you invest heavily in the current technology and things change a lot, right? Um, so one of the... The primary things that um, uh, that was mentioned already is their ability to hallucinate, and this can be possibly a strength. Maybe if you're working on protein synthesis, that's where the creativity comes from. Um, but it can also be somewhat of a, of a concern, right? So, for example, what I mean by hallucinate is um, you can ask the model. I asked it to generate a speaker bio, speaker bio for me. Um, it actually did a better job than I expected, so it knows like where I got my PhD and where I work and things like that. Um, probably just lifted it off my webpage. Um, but it also like gave me a ton of awards that I've never actually received. So I'm very <laughs> flattered, <laughs> ChatGPT. I would love to have all of these grants, and maybe it knows something I don't know, and I should be, uh, here's where the faith comes in. But I'm probably quite sure it just filled in the blanks by thinking of many of my more heavily awarded peers who I am similar to on other dimensions and said, these seem like plausible things to put at this point in a bio, right? And what? I hope so. Let us hope so, yeah. Um, and so this is the kind of thing where really it's quite application dependent, right? So this ability to kind of imagine or fill in the blanks based on what it does know can be a really, really powerful tool, but in other applications entails very high risk. So if you think about this in something like a search setting, um, you definitely don't want uh, uh, you definitely don't want models saying things that sound quite plausible, sound quite true, and are actually ungrounded in reality. Um, the verification aspect of this might be as labor intensive as having done the search yourself, right? So having you can think about automated processes. People are thinking about automated processes for trying to fact check. Um, but you're now kind of building hallucinating AI on top of hallucinating AI, so it's not, it's not a solved problem. It's a thing people are actively working on. It's definitely not a solved problem. Um, I would say this is also a thing that you can imagine kind of legal consequences if you have it doing things like customer service relations or um, you know, share, shareholder briefings or something where it might say things that are just false and there could be big risks associated with that. Um, an article I'd really recommend kind of on this issue that I thought was nicely written um, it was this um, from The New Yorker that kind of likens models like ChatGPT to like a, a blurry JPEG of the web, right? So you can think of it as this low resolution compressed version of all the information that's out there. So you can imagine when you're thinking about what kinds of applications is it appropriate for, you have to make sure it's applications that you're okay with a lossy compression and then a reconstruction that might not be faithful to the original, right? And there are some cases where that's fine and there's some cases where it's not. Um, another really prominent and kind of hopefully uh, a concern that people are well aware of um, is that AI and machine learning models are highly biased. Um, and so again, depending on the applications we're using it for, this could be a really, uh, really significant risk. I think it's important to emphasize because there's been good work and like a lot of awareness of this issue for many, many years. There's like the Weapons of Math Destruction um, book that maybe many people have heard of. So like it's been very much in the ethos that statistical models are highly biased and yet we've made very little progress on it. So this is a really hard problem. Like those models have gotten better and better and better. And still, if you ask, this was Dolly 2 or one of the image generation models for a surgeon, you get some white guys. If you ask for a secretary, you get some kind of suggestive looking women. And this isn't the kind of thing you want to have at the heart of an HR system. You don't want to have it at the heart of a customer service system. Um, I don't have the 
slide um, on it, but there is a, I saw a recent result that the models also can do some profiling of the person they're talking to and treat them differently. So for example, more likely to give an uneducated user uh, incorrect information, right? And that's really not something you would want in a customer facing application. Um, and those kinds of concerns get worse as the models get bigger, right? So the kind of scaling we would do to make the models um, perform better might also mean that some of these risks get more severe. Um, so a really important one I want to bring up is the, the issue of reward hacking. Um, this is specific to this reinforcement learning component, but I think is a really, really big risk. So what I mean by reward hacking is basically you define something you want the model to optimize for. You say something like, I'm going to have a model that's a customer service agent, and it's going to have some chat with a person, um, and I want to like, you know, maximize the the customer's rating at the end of that review, you know, how satisfied with the discussion was your problem solved, right? Um, but it might find some kind of odd ways of, of maximizing that reward, which seems like the right thing to measure. And if you had humans doing this, that's the right thing to measure. Um, when you have models doing it, they might find some kind of weird loopholes, right? So there is, actually, I'm going to try to pull up this video. So there's a nice illustration in this. Um, from these agents that were trained by OpenAI. This was several years ago. The underlying technology is very really similar to what we're using. Um, and these were teams of agents that were supposed to play a hide and seek game. So there's like one team trying to hide from the others and the others trying to find them. It's very cute. They have like cute little faces and their eyes beam when they find each other. Um, and they can like move blocks around and like build walls and things like that. Um, but in the game engine they use, there's basically a bug in the physics engine and the models, the seekers quickly find this and exploit this so that they can ricochet off the walls and fly and like look at the seekers or look at the hiders from like flying overhead and things like that, right? Um, they could exploit it so they could like throw blocks out of the world and make them disappear in a way that weren't supposed to. Um, so this is very much like a cute illustration of something that you can imagine going very badly in the real world. So once you imagine that you have a, a generative AI system that you're giving some even limited access to, for example, an API because you want it to make, be able to take actions on behalf. You don't just want a chatbot. You might want it to be able to do things like, you know, cancel an order when the customer reaches out and says, I'd like to cancel this order. Or even do a very simple thing like send an email in order to confirm a receipt or something. So you have some limited API access. And unless you're entirely sure that is completely bug free, which as far as I know, we're never confident of, there's a good chance the models will be able to find and exploit those bugs. Um, and maybe you'll catch it, but maybe only after some significant damage, right? Um, and so actually one of the, I think the kind of high level, and I'm emphasizing this because like I said, I think it uh, piggybacks nicely off the panel. Um, the kind of interpretability aspect um, is really huge here. So we have this very, very exciting technology, but it is uh, the kind of, the excitement is there on the, uh, the scientific side too. Like we're a bit surprised at how good it is and we don't actually understand how it's so good. Um, so I think Sydney was a really good illustration of that kind of thing. Like people spent a lot of time, smart people worked on that system, you put it out in the wild and it starts doing things that we didn't expect it to do. Um, and so I, I think a really good analogy, I, I hate to make analogies between these models and the human brain because there are, of course, many differences. Um, but from like a scientific understanding, I think that's a, a nice analogy, which is basically like we have no idea how the brain works, right? Like we don't know how, like what is the software people are running to get um, from inputs to outputs. Um, and so we don't feel super comfortable saying that we could precisely control a person, right? Like we don't actually know what's happening under the hood. And so the kind of level of understanding we have about these models is somewhat analogous. Like the way we wouldn't say we understand brains because they're just neurons, right? Like that's a deeply unsatisfying explanation for how we get this advanced behavior. That's similarly, that's kind of the level of understanding we have about these models. Um, so as we're, um, as we're trying to deploy them, like we kind of want to proceed with that level of caution. I'm, I'm quite an optimist, I think that in the next five, definitely 10 years, we're going to have a really deep understanding of how they work, right? But that kind of understanding might really influence how we want to use them, how we don't want to use them, what kinds of safeguards are in place, what kinds of regulations are in place. Um, so I think that's just really what I want to emphasize and kind of the technical side, um, that I think it's a very, very exciting opportunity. It's also moving incredibly fast, and there's like a very good chance that three years from now, we're going to look back on the stuff we were saying now and be like, wow, were we wrong about X, Y, and Z, right? Because that's kind of how this field works. Um, so I think it's, 
it's not too soon to be thinking about business opportunities for this, and we should actually be total, completely exploring them. Um, but there's that kind of healthy caution to have in there, right, as, as we're thinking about this and just being prepared for those kinds of risks, being prepared to be super flexible and mobile as our understanding advances along with our, the technology itself. And I am exactly at 20 minutes, so I will stop there. <laughs>